Robert Kaplan, welcome to Canberra. It's my pleasure to be here. Could I start with a brutally simplified view of your intellectual move across the decade? You started off, I suggest to you, uh, the 9-11 decade, thinking that the US as an imperium had the power and the will to defeat geography and history. But in your latest book, you are perhaps suggesting that geography and history might just win. Yes, it's brutally simplified, but it's fairly accurate. It's not that geography and history must win. It's that we have to take into account how formidable they are in order to overcome them. Now, how big of a shock has that been to the United States? I think it's been a very big shock. Uh, I, remember, realists are only popular when the very lack of realism leads to something demonstrably horrible. Uh, such as the way the Iraq War uh, went from what I never could have believed, from a, from a, a, a situation worse than Saddam Hussein. I had been to Iraq several times, and every time I went there I said, what's worse than this? You can't get any worse than this. And I'd go to Syria under Hafez al-Assad, and I said, this is a liberal humanist paradise compared to Saddam Hussein's Iraq. Well, you could get worse than Saddam. You could get nobody in charge. And and that was a real comeuppance to, uh, to Washington, to the United States. Uh, because even those who were opposed to the war were sometimes people who were in favor of the interventions in the Balkans and Panama and Haiti. So they were opposed to this particular war, not necessarily to intervention in general. But what the Iraq War did was make people skeptical of intervention in general, which can be a dangerous thing in its own right, because each situation is different. And there will be interventions in the future, perhaps, that we should do uh, under different circumstances. But the Iraq War made even liberals for a time in Washington realists. And by realists, I mean people who are skeptical of progress, skeptical that there can be improvements in the situation, who believe that interests are more important than values, that order is more important than freedom. Because in Iraq in 2006, 2007, we saw that Yes, order was actually more humane than disorder, as brutal as that order had been. And that skepticism has really gone across a lot of areas. Skepticism about humanitarian interventions, skepticism about air power. All of that revenge of geography yeah. is making the United States ask some very hard questions of itself. Right. And remember, um, the, the skepticism about the intervention in Libya, Obama's decision that we'll intervene, but we're not going to put troops on the ground, whatever happens. And the skeptic skepticism about intervening in Syria, even with a limited no-fly zone, all devolves from the experience in Iraq. And air power has suffered skepticism, not just because of what the U.S. Air Force promised in Iraq but couldn't deliver, but what the Israeli Air Force promised in southern Lebanon in 2006 and couldn't deliver either. And remember, Libya is still evolving. We don't know how that's going to turn out. Just this morning, I read on a website that two militias had a, had a grand fight out with people lying in the streets in Tripoli. Uh, so the triple, why were there al-Qaeda training facilities outside Benghazi? Because the Tripoli government has no writ beyond greater Tripoli. So we don't know which, a year, two years from now, the Libyan intervention could look okay. It could also look disastrous. The Vietnam syndrome had a huge impact on the American military and American foreign policy for a generation, gener maybe more. What is the Iraq syndrome going to do to America? I don't think it's going to permanently make interventions uh, 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 politically unfeasible. The reason I believe that is because the United States may not be an imperial power technically, but it's in an imperial-like situation. Whenever I say that to people, they get angry at me. You the got a lot of imperial yeah, grunts, as you right. say. A lot of uh, we have American troops around the world, especially 
ground troops, Marines and soldiers, have had, a, you know, you, the only historical comparison for their experiences on the ground from South Korea to Afghanistan are the experiences of imperial ground troops of, 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 of Great Britain, of France, of Portugal, of Holland, of other empires in history. So the U.S. is in an imperial-like situation. And over the decades, due to prosperity and education, the United States has bred what I call an imperial class. And what is an imperial class? Is it some right-wing militaristic person? No, that's not what it is at all. An imperial class includes humanitarian interventionists. Because remember, when Rudyard Kipling wrote his poem, The White Man's Burden, we may today th read those lines and think of it as racist, but he meant it as supporting humanitarian improvement of countries around the world who needed Western development. In fact, he wrote the poem in order to encourage the United States in the Philippines in 1899. And he meant it in only the most idealistic way, not in a racist or condescending way at all. And we, we now have an imperial class who think tanks, uh, liberal, liberal humanists, others, who um, who have significant power in the media, who have grown up under American prosperity, and do not realize the constraints that policymakers in the State Department, uh, uniformed and civilian people in the Pentagon are under. So what I wrote a book about, The Revenge of Geography, if you had to boil it down to with what's it about in one word, I'd say constraints. Uh, it, you know, there are limits to what can be achieved. If the U.S. is the, the empire of, of globalization, the, the U.S. is an expression of globalization, and globalization is an expression of the United States. I think one of the things that struck me as one of your most pessimistic lines um, was your view that liberal democracy will not necessarily triumph any more than the present system of nation states, and that globalization might just lose out to nationalism and, and other military well, powers. Well, I, I think that nationalism is an underrated force in the early 21st century. Just, just look at Asia. What's going on in the South China Sea, the East China Sea, the Sea of Japan between South Korea and Japan? This is all nationalism. Uh, uh, we thought that, that capitalist prosperity, which the countries of the Pacific Rim have experienced since the late 1970s, in fact, would lead to globalization, and it has. But it's also led to military acquisitions and nationalistic cohesion, because suddenly you have countries like China. China, Vietnam, uh, Malaysia, other countries, that, that their periods of civil conflicts internally are over. They've consolidated in terms of institutions and bureaucracies so that they can now build navies and air forces and project power outward. And lo and behold, they have territorial disputes in the maritime sphere. Europe. Europe is, I think, when you, look, when you take a step back and look at the, uh, the dramatic economic problems in the EU, it's leading to a burst of nationalism in countries as diverse as Greece and Hungary. Uh, Russia, Russia is very nationalistic. I think that the, the global elite tends to see the world is now driven by economics, humani humanitarianism, women's rights, things like that. But what they're really seeing is like a self-regarding sense of themselves and when they meet people just like themselves in other countries, but don't probe deep into what's really going on in those countries. So I think exclusivist forces like nationalism in Asia, sectarianism in the Middle East, have a, have a very bright future. And they have a bright future because not everyone is a member of the global elite. I think you're, you've got a very personal and complicated take on this, these complicated judgment calls that the United States uh, has to make. I, I think at one point, as you say in your book, uh, Balkan, uh, your book Balkan, Go Ghosts, Balkan Ghosts, was used as an excuse by the Clinton administration for non-intervention in, in the early mm -hmm. 1990s. And that's something that will 
quote to quote you, forever cause you great grief. Yeah. Um, but equally, you have expressed deep remorse because your position on taking out Saddam Hussein in Iraq was also quite influential. Now, those very two different judgment yeah. calls um, raise interesting questions for a journalist. But what would you say to a strategist or a politician who is trying to confront some of those issues? And you've been on both sides of that, that fence. What I would say is, first of all, my opinion on Iraq, I don't know how influential it was. I was just owning up to the mistake I made. There were maybe dozens of people, many dozens, who were far more influential than I who never owned up to their mistake. But what I would say to any policymaker, for instance, the administration contemplating action in Syria today. Let's take something concrete and real. What I would say, I wouldn't tell them intervene or don't intervene. I would say, here's how to think about it. You can't say we have to have an exit strategy in advance because if you demand an exit strategy for every intervention, you'll, you'll be immobilized. You'll never do anything. You can't know the end of something at the beginning. That's too much to ask. But what you can do is say, where will we be three or four steps ahead of this? If we establish a no-fly zone in Syria, what will that lead to? It will probably lead to the quickening end of the Assad regime. But where will that lead to? Will that lead to a better human rights situation or perhaps even more chaos? Is the last structural glue to, to authority in Syria collapses? So I, would, I wouldn't say intervene or don't intervene, I'd say think th three or four steps ahead where you're likely to be or where you might be and make your decision based on that. The big geography debate that we're having, um, the Australian government has just put out an Asian white paper, the Asian century. Um, the United States still, the United States leaders still like to talk about the Pacific century. Uh, the Australian military actually prefers the Asia-Pacific century because it, it gets a bit closer to, uh, to, the, to having that implicit, explicit American role. But obviously also uh, the Indo-Pacific is yeah. the coming idea, the, the Indo-Pacific from, from Bollywood to Hollywood. Uh, which, which way of thinking about this geography would you see as most influential? All right, first of all, all three connect. Because what the Indo-Pacific really means is that the borders of Cold War area studies, Southeast Asia, East Asia, South Asia, are collapsing. And we have more of a fluid organic continuum, a maritime sphere uh, that stretches all the way from the Persian Gulf to the Sea of Japan, where energy, oil, and natural gas from the Persian Gulf makes its way across the, the oceanic interstate we'll call it, to the customers in East Asia. So, so there is an Indo-Pacific uh, uh, be, because of the collapse of distance and the, um, and the erosion of Cold War area studies. We also have, um, we, we also have an Asian century uh, coming up in the sense that Asia is to the extent that any place in the world can be the global demographic heartline, heartland, the economic heart, heartland, and the military heartland. It's more in Asia than it is in anywhere else, particularly because European populations are diminishing and European defense budgets on the whole are diminishing. So you have Asia becoming more and more important. You have the concept of Asia being enlarged to include India and the Persian Gulf with it because of, uh, uh, because of, tech, because of the way technology collapses distance. And I think the real challenge or the real question for Australia is, and this was, I think, brilliantly brought out in Hugh White's book, um, which is, how do we deal with China? Do we, uh, do, do we balance between China and the United States? Uh, it, it, do we make room for China? Because if China is going to be big and powerful in a military sense, and they're not Iran, they're not threatening to destroy any other country, uh, shouldn't we make room for it? Shouldn't the Americans make room for it? The only thing I would add is that don't think in a linear fashion. 
for the last few decades, we've had benign autocrats in power in Beijing, very predictable, conservative people who hand it off to power every decade or so to another generation. We may not have that forever. Uh, China internally is starting to go through changes, and we may have more disruptions internally in China, which may lead to a more nationalistic military that will be less benign uh, than, in, than in decades past. So don't assume that the next few decades in dealing with China will be as easy as the last few decades. You write of China that it is not a status quo power. You describe it as an immature power. But equally, um, you think that the chance of war between the U.S. and China is extremely remote. Why? I think it's extremely remote for the moment. I mean, I can't see it in the future for several reasons. First of all, we're dealing with a maritime geography. And I think maritime geographies are more benign than closed-in, claustrophobic, dry land geographies like Europe throughout most of history. Secondly, though China may not be democratic, its authoritarian system is relatively benign and that China's leaders are 90 percent preoccupied with domestic issues, with having to provide new jobs every year for tens of millions of more young Chinese. Uh, so that makes them very cautious, in a sense. Um, at the same time, they feel that the South China Sea is to them what the Caribbean was to the United States, that they need to dominate it at some point. But caution really governs in this. Also, what would a war in China lead to? You, it's easy to begin a war with China, but how would you end it? You know, think, think of it that way. Uh, how would you end a war with China? Would it lead to regime change in Beijing? These are, these are incredibly impossible questions to even ponder. So I think, and also the Chinese regime is not illegitimate. We could argue that regimes in Nazi Germany and Tehran, for various reasons of their extremist statements and actions, have been illegitimate. But there is nothing illegitimate about the Chinese regime. So that's why I think war is remote. And what the U.S. will, what we're going to see over the next few years and decades is an incredibly sophisticated balancing take place between various powers. China, as you say, is more comfortable, more settled at, on land than it's been for centuries. And the, the big yeah. change, the big coming change, is, is China turning its, its mind and its resources to the idea of being a naval power. The U.S. heading towards uh, a, a navy of in the low 200 ships. How much can the U.S. actually run the, the classic naval strategy and make that work? Uh, okay. Uh, the U.S. Navy now is about 284 warships. Uh, it's, the U.S. policymakers would like to increase that number. The Congressional Budget Office says that it probably won't, regardless of official statements, that the number is more likely to go down over the decades than to go up. Now, 250 warships is a different sort of world. Uh, if the, uh, a world with 250 U.S. warships is a very different world than a, a world with 330 U.S. warships, for instance. It means a much more multipolar military world. It means a world in East Asia, the Western Pacific, where China is much more powerful. And this has repercussions throughout East Asia and the Indian Ocean. So, but this transition to a smaller navy will be very gradual. Uh, on, on, on the U.S.'s part. And navies really show you how strong your economy is because of the expense of warships. Yet, I mean, the new Gerald R. Ford uh, aircraft carrier with nothing on it is in the $14 billion range, you know, just the hull, essentially. So I, I think all in all, we are headed to a more multi, a, a militarily multipolar world in East Asia. And that's, 
got to be uh, troubling news for Australia because it means Australia has to make choices that it never made before. Before, it had a great thing going. Um, it could trade with China, and, and you know, China rose, Australia rose, because China was such a big market. And meanwhile, you had a, the unipolar U.S. Navy and Air Force implicitly providing uh, protection so that Australia didn't need a, a great, you know, a great military in, in terms of size. But things may be changing. So what sort of questions does the United States ask of its close ally, Australia, about one, its military choices and about some of its other I, geostrategic I, choices? I think the, the U.S. is heading towards a world where it's going to be, uh, where it's going to put more pressure on its allies to do more for themselves militarily, from Japan all the way south to Australia. I think we're headed towards a world where the U.S. will rely on Australia much more than in the past because Australia has a very interesting geographical situation at the confluence of the Indian and Pacific Oceans. Um, it's shown that it both its 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 left wing and right wing parties can can agree you know can agree on military expansion. Uh, this is not true of Great Britain. Uh, uh, Great Britain is a, is a steeply declining military power in a, in, a, in a geographical situation which is less interesting than in the 20th century. Do you think those sort of strategic, geostrategic questions are so, so bluntly evident in, in Asia that it means Australia is going to com continue to be really focused on the U.S. alliance. Whatever, whatever else its economic it's interests say to it. It's going to be focused on the U.S. alliance at the same time. It's going to have to hedge. It's going to have to make sure that its relations with China, uh, not to mention all the other countries so in Asia. So Australia might start to look a lot like ASEAN, for instance. It might start to look the way it won't, Southeast Asia looks. It won't go that far. It, it won't go that far because Australia doesn't have many people. It's got 22 million people on a vast continent. So it and, and that makes it vulnerable. And because it's vulnerable, it's, it would like to have the protect, protection of the world's greatest sea power, which is the United States, and will remain the United States for some, you know, for a decade or so into the future. Only a decade. I don't know. I would say a few decades, because I think that there is bipartisan political support in Washington for a reasonably sized Navy and Air Force. But if you're you putting that sort of time scale on it, then a couple of decades out, you're looking at an incredibly complicated set of plays with the rising India oh, and China. Absolutely. Look, nothing lasts forever. Uh, it, it, from the end of World War II right up through the beginning, the early years of the 21st century, Asia was very simple. It was a unipolar uh, maritime landscape because Japan was wrecked in World War II. China was wrecked in World War II. The Philippines, uh, Malaysia, or what was Malaya, and Vietnam wrecked themselves with internal rebellions. So that there was no competition for the U.S. Navy and Air Force, even with the defeat in Vietnam. And so, but that, that is not, those days are past. These other countries, as I said, were, are consolidating their, their, themselves internally, able to project externally. And, and, and China is, uh, you know, China's becoming a, one of the world's greatest air and sea powers. And I think that Japan is coming out of its semi-pacifistic shell and adopting a more normal attitude towards military power. And don't assume the situation on the Korean Peninsula will stay the same forever. So ironically, one of the, the big outcomes of the, the Iraq syndrome for the United States might be some echoes of the Vietnam syndrome, in, a, in that it'll change the way that America thinks about what it wants in Asia and what it's able to do in Asia. I, I think it... it I think because of Iraq, particularly the American public wants protection on the cheap. That's why it loves these drone strikes. The media can write thousands of 
pages about how morally ambiguous they are, how the president doesn't have the right to decide to kill people and all. The public loves it. The, and, and, the, and, and, and the President Obama, in, you know, in his four years in office, you know, understood that because it offered protection on the cheap without ground troops. And navies and air forces are less threatening to the public, even though they cost a lot of money, because navies and air forces project power on a daily basis in peacetime and provides diplomats with the seat at the head of the table, whereas ground troops are more threatening. Ground troops are used for contingencies only, when you miscalculate, when you have to go to war, the public likes that a lot less after Iraq. That's why one of the, um, one of the constraints on intervening in Syria is that the president has to know that if he intervenes, he better settle the situation within weeks. Because if it goes two months and it isn't settled, the American public will just revolt. Let's finish where we started with your book, Revenge of Geography, which had a, had a, a really wonderful review in the New York Times, which pro provoked two letters, angry letters to the editor from geography professors. So any review that, that, that provokes geography professors has got to be a winner. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. And it was by uh, Anne-Marie Slaughter. And I thought, uh, in many ways, she's, she was quite fair to you before she put the knife in. So yes. Let, yeah, let's, yeah. So let's well, that's what reviewers do. Indeed. Yeah, so let's yeah, give you yeah, Anne-Marie yeah. Slaughter and, and write a reply to you. Okay. Uh, and she says that you see the world as a relief map, one defined by the sharp peaks and narrow valleys that trap populations and open plains and broad waterways that impel and allow them to move. His emphasis on humanity's divisions is telling, leading directly to his embrace of realism in foreign policy. Kaplan assumes that mankind is, in essence, divided rather than connected, and she refers to Thucydides and his Fear, Self-Interest and Honour trilogy, and finishes with that your take on human nature is both old-fashioned and, at least in the era of neuroscience and cognitive psychology, very male. Yes. Well, my wife would agree with her. <laughs> so my wife read the review and said, oh, she's right, Robert. Yeah. Behind every successful man is an astonished woman. Yes, yes. Okay. yes. But my reply would be, in all seriousness, that it may be old-fashioned, and according to psychologists, it may be very male, but that doesn't mean it's wrong. Um, that's a value judgment. It's not a substantive analytical disputation. Uh, you know, people, other reviewers got angry at me for writing about dead males, Halford McKinder and Nicholas Spikeman, and my reply was, we're all going to be dead someday. And, but, but some of us will still be relevant, uh, you know, after we're dead. And the, ge and the geographers that I wrote about in this book, I believe, are very relevant to our present situation, which is that we all operate under geographical constraints, that geography goes a long way to explaining what was really behind World War II and the Cold War, and that geography today says much about China's situation about Iran's situation, about Europe's situation even. And it's not that geography determines everything. It's just that we have to take it into account. And the purpose of the book was to resurrect it as a legitimate field of study after it had fallen into, uh, after it had been relegated for, you know, relegated by international economics, financial markets, political science, etc. Robert Kaplan, the man who can even make geographers passionate. Thank you. My pleasure. <laughs>